Hello, I'm Iskander Ziyashev. Uh, I was a distinguished lecturer du during the 2006 season. And first order of business is to acknowledge SPE Foundation and American Institute of Mining, Metallurgical, and Petroleum Engineers for their contribution to this program. Uh, the title of my presentation is Russia's Recent Past and Future in Oil and Gas Production. If I only had five minutes to talk about Russian oil industry, I would probably make those three statements, and that would be enough to understand the snapshot of the industry today. Uh, Russia is capable of increasing its oil production to about 12 million barrels of oil per day over the next 7 to 10 years. And that will require approximately $12 billion per year in oil field capex. That would not be including the major infrastructure projects like major pipelines. And the third point, which is the most important, Russian resource base is much larger than is commonly believed and it is at least 150 billion barrels of oil. And it's not, that is not counting gas. It's not oil equivalent. So in the recent past, oil production has grown from about 6 to about 9.49. Actually, now it's about 9.6 million barrels of oil per day with the exports and, uh, of about 3.7 million barrels of oil per day. That was during the first half of 2005. And in my estimate, and uh, I need to qualify that, it is an engineering estimate that is based on availability of resources and uh, how much production capacity can be built when we invest about $12 billion per year in oil field capex. So in my estimate, Russian oil production will peak at about 12 to 12.5 million barrels of oil per day, which is the historical maximum of Soviet Union. And uh, the production will peak and stay at about that level during the decade of 2010 to 2020. And there would be available for export approximately 6.7 million barrels of oil per day. Uh, this map shows major producing areas and exploration maturity. And we can see here that in the European part, we have fairly well explored areas like Timan Pechora, Volga Urals, and uh, south of Russia and Caucasus, and a fairly well explored area in Western Siberia, which is a main petroleum producing basin in Russia. Uh, there are also areas that are at uh, some first steps, stages of development, and there, there some exploration have been done there, but not much. It's a very large Eastern Siberian uh, basin that's really a combination of several different basins. And uh, this is the Barents Sea, which is the continuation of known trends from onshore into the offshore. But there are many more areas and uh, basins that can be quite prolific, but they have not been explored so far. Uh, so wh when I will be talking uh, about the production rates and about the production forecast and resource base, I will be mainly talking about those basins because we don't really have much information uh, from the, those unexplored frontier areas. So future of Russian oil. Uh, during the decade of 2010 to 2020, uh, the decline of Western Siberian production will be compensated by development of new fields in Eastern Siberia and Timan Pechora and Russian Arctic offshore. And there will be approximately one, maybe 1.1 or 1.2 million barrels of oil per day available in Pacific direction and uh, available in Atlantic direction. That would be new capacity, export capacity. 
And uh, the, the next statement may be actually incorrect because I am basing this on the current state of technology. So quite possible that by the year 2020, the enhanced oil recovery technology, the stimulation technology, the residual characterization technology will enable us to produce a lot more in Western Siberia than what we think about today. But uh, from the today's knowledge, I think that after 2020, the decline of Western Siberia will not be compensated completely, and that would result in a gentle annual decline of approximately 5% per year. So that is the production forecast and uh, historical production and production forecast. The red curve here with triangles is the historical production and after 2000, the production, this curve was actually uh, made in 2003. So I, I created this forecast in 2003. And since the distinguished lecture process is a fairly long process, the, you know, creating the presentation, selecting the presentation, and then uh, first time I was making this presentation was almost two years ago now. So a lot of things have been have changed. Uh, the rate of growth is somewhat different from what I projected, but the trend is really the same. Uh, so according to this forecast, the production plateau of Russian Federation could be of approximately 12 million barrels or so. And the cumulative production, which is the blue curve, would reach approximately 290 billion barrels by the year 2060. And uh, that uh, today, about 130 billion barrels or 125 billion barrels have been produced. So that puts us uh, at the number of approximately 150 billion barrels more to be produced in the next 50 years. There is a uh, very persistent misconception about the uh, amount of Russian reserves. And it comes from this sharp decline that was happening during the perestroika time. This sharp decline when the Russian economy was going from the state planned economy into a market economy. And when outside world was looking at the Russian production, the understanding of this production, the explanation for production decline, uh, was made uh, using Hubbard's peak, uh, Hubbard's curve. And if we were to continue on the sharp decline, we would probably end up with a cumulative production of about 160 billion barrels. So at the low point of this production profile, we have produced about 105 billion barrels. So that is how the number of about 50 plus billion barrels of reserves was calculated. The cumulative production under this dashed curve forecast minus the production, cumulative production by year about uh, 1998, and that was about 50 billion barrels of Russian reserves. So today, in many publications, you still see the numbers that are approximately you know, 65 to 70 plus billion barrels. The numbers have been revised uh, over the last few years due to several reasons, like the super majors like uh, BP and Shell are operating in Russia and start understanding the environment a lot better. So in the BP statistical review, the numbers are approximately about 70 billion barrels. Uh, and also the change in the production trend uh, shows that there is a lot more oil to be produced. Also, most of the uh, big Russian oil companies have their reserves audited. 
by the uh, reserve auditing firms. Uh, so all of those numbers add, all of those factors add credibility to the numbers that I'm quoting now. There is also a very easy way to, uh, and very simple way, I would say a very simple way to uh, substantiate the number of approximately 150 billion barrels. So uh, I remember this chart where we we have only few provinces uh, fairly well explored and developed, and uh, Eastern Siberia and Barren Sea and Sakhalin at the uh, fairly early stages of development, and many provinces at the frontier exploration stage. So on this chart, I show on the x-axis time in years and on the y-axis cumulative oil reserves discovered. And here I'm using the term reserves a little bit incorrectly. It's really proved, geologically proved and technically recoverable, but not necessarily commercial. Uh, uh, so cumulative oil uh, reserves technically uh, recoverable uh, reserves. If we, if we used the simple creaming curve type of prediction of ultimate reserves to be discovered in those basins that have been explored so far, and that's Western Siberia, uh, Europe, and Eastern Siberia, we would end up by the estimate, with the estimate of approximately 300 billion barrels. So uh, here we're not taking into account all of the resources that can be found in the Arctic, Russian Arctic offshore. And there we do not have good information to, uh, to be used in that kind of projection. Uh, as you can see here during the 60s and 70s, there was a rapid increase in oil reserves. But during this period of time, it was flat. And it was flat uh, not because of the lack of resources. It was really flat because of lack of exploration activities. Because at that point in time, uh, centrally managed uh, Ministry of Geology essentially ceased to exist, or uh, Ministry of Geology uh, stopped being the uh, most important entity looking after exploration. And during that period of time, private oil companies started to uh, do exploration. But private oil companies uh, had lots of reserves on their books. They had, some of the companies had 30 plus year of reserve life and did not have much capital. So companies were not focused on exploration. And, and that, that's the uh, uh, comparison of typical reserve life of Russian oil companies compared with the international majors. International majors have the reserve life somewhere around 10 years, and typical Russian oil companies have the reserve life around 20 years. So there was not much incentive during that difficult time to, for oil companies to spend money on exploration. Uh, also, I, I want to say a few words uh, to discuss the current uh, state of the why the oil prices are so high, why there is so much discussion about limited reserves or limited resources in the world. Well, the oil and gas resources, here you see the diagram of oil and gas resources, and you can see that about half of those oil and gas resources are located in two provinces, in the Middle East and in the former Soviet Union. And only about 7% of all exploration wells 
that were drilled during 95 to 2003 were drilled in those areas. And almost two-thirds of the exploration wells were drilled in North America, where there is only about 12% of oil and gas resources to be found. So there was a mismatch between exploration activities and exploration potential. And another very important point is about 25% of oil and gas resources are located in Arctic Shelf. And that's the area that is not uh, well explored even today. So there is still a lot of potential and a lot of work to be done in the Arctic Shelf. Uh, let me now say a few words uh, about the uh, main Russian oil provinces where I see that there will be a lot of growth. So the Timan Pechora, it has uh, today about 185 oil and gas fields discovered. And the reserves are approximately 10 billion barrels. And the oil reserves and gas reserves are approximately 35,000 BCF. Total oil and gas resources in place volume in the Timan Pechora and Barents and Karskaya Sea, which are, uh, those trends are continuing, those onshore trends are continuing into the offshore. So total oil and gas resources are estimated at about 260 billion barrels of oil equivalent, uh, with only about one quarter of that on the onshore. So there is still a lot of potential uh, in that area. Another area that uh, we'll see uh, development and increase of oil production is the eastern Siberia. And I'm using here the estimate done uh, by Dr. Raymond Leonard, uh, who was the vice president for exploration in Yukos Oil Company. And uh, his realistic estimate is that the risk recoverable reserves are approximately at about 17 billion barrels, with a production plateau of about 2.5 to 3 million barrels of oil per day, and available for export approximately 1 to 1 and a quarter million barrels of oil per day. Uh, the capacity of the oil pipeline, main pipeline in the Pacific direction that is being built today is actually uh, more than this one to one and a quarter million barrels of oil per day. So it, it seems uh, like the uh, more optimistic view on what the supplies are going to be has been taken for the design of the oil pipeline. So talking about Arctic offshore, uh, that, that's the top view of the Arctic Ocean. And uh, here I show main oil and gas basins. And you can see that if 25% of oil and gas resources in the world are in this area, then Maybe three quarters of that would be in the Russian Arctic offshore. Uh, so Barents Sea is something that uh, have been proved up from the western side. Norwegian companies are working here. From, and uh, we have found s several fields in the Barents Sea. And some smaller fields are the continuation of the trends from onshore. Karskaya Sea. Karskaya Sea is really the, uh, there are offshore oil and gas fields that are really the continuation of the known Western Siberian Basin. Alaptiv Sea can be also very prolific, and East Siberian Sea and Chukchi Sea. Chukchi Sea has a similar geology uh, with the offshore Alaska. So there are similarities, and there that also uh, we believe that there is also significant exploration potential in the Chukchi Sea. Uh, this slide shows estimated oil and gas resources of Russian Arctic offshore. And uh, 
the, this estimate was done in 1993 by the Institute for Ocean Geology. Uh, it is a little bit old estimate, but the reason why I'm using it, that was the uh, only consistent study when the same group of experts looked at all available data. And uh, not much was done since that in terms of actual you know, drilling or actual seismic acquisition. So even though, in my opinion, those estimates are a little bit on the high side, they are somewhat optimistic, I think that we can use those numbers as a relative comparison between those different basins. So uh, in billion tons of oil equivalent, and one ton is approximately seven barrels. So we can see that in Barents Sea, there is a big oil component, but there is even bigger gas component. With the total uh, oil and gas resources of approximately, say, 200 billion barrels of oil equivalent. And Karsk AC is probably even higher with approximately, say, 350 billion barrels of oil equivalent. Uh, other basins are smaller in the size, but they're still significant. Uh, again, I believe that uh, those estimates are optimistic, and uh, I, I think that they're not accounted here for geologic risks. So in reality, the oil and gas recoverable reserves, once they're proved up, will be much smaller, but at least that gives a feel for relative importance of the different basins. Th this is the chart that shows uh, that there are some fields discovered offshore that are continuation of the onshore trend in Timan Pechora. There are some fields discovered or offshore Yamal Peninsula, and they are continuing the trends, the trend from uh, Western Siberia. Uh, there is a lot of discussion going <coughs> around Stokmanovsky field today. Uh, is a giant gas field offshore Barents Sea. But what people oh, do not know that there are many other structures of a similar size further to the north that have not been you know, drilled up, but there is some seismic data indicating that those structures are there. So the potential of Barents Sea is quite significant. Factors needed for continued growth of Russian oil industry. Uh, there are three important factors. One is technology evolution of the upstream of entire oil. Russian oil industry. Another one is competitive, clear, and transparent licensing rules that would open up Barents Sea, Timan Pechora, East Siberia, and Russian Arctic offshore for exploration and production. And uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources have done over the last few years a very good job of uh, informing the oil companies about the auctions the oil companies are actively participating. Over the last, uh, say, two or years, uh, there was more work done in this direction than five years before that. So uh, it seems uh, like there are some positive signs there. We would also need the uh, construction of major pipelines to Murmansk and in the far east direction. How much money will the growth cost? Uh, extrapolating from today's performance of the best operators, it will take about $12 billion per year. Um, the total capex of Yukos, Sibneft, and Slavneft in 2003 was approximately 2 billion barrels. Uh, those three companies represented one-third of Russian oil industry in 2003. The development 
of eastern Siberia and of Arctic offshore will require large investments. And $12 billion per year uh, is an estimate that combines the capex that is needed for uh, redevelopment and development of oil fields in western Siberia and some uh, development of some new fields in eastern Siberia and in the offshore. Why is it relatively inexpensive? And relatively inexpensive, it's not to say that $12 billion is not a lot of money, but it's relatively inexpensive in comparison with, say, uh, end of 80s uh, and beginning of 90s. It's relatively inexpensive due to the new strategy for field development. Uh, we drill fewer wells and better wells. Most of those wells are stimulated and we actively employ horizontal drilling technology. And well targets are defined by advanced trezor modeling. And last but not least, it's important to produce every well to its full potential. This chart shows the comparison of oil rates, and it is somewhat conceptual chart. Uh, I made this chart after uh, following the thinking process of Joe Mack. Joe Mack is an Oklahoma oil man who was in charge of production in Yucas Oil Company. So the typical Western Siberian well about, say, 10 years ago would make about 9 tons per day. If this very same well was just not damaged with the skin of zero and if it were produced with a full drawdown that uh, today's technology uh, allows us to have, the production rate would go to about 50 tons per day, or actually to about 70 maybe, yeah, about 50 tons per day. So the very same well, if it was stimulated, would be capable of producing 100 tons per day, about 700 barrels per day. So there is an order of magnitude improvement that is very easy to achieve. Stimulation and uh, modern equipment, modern ESPs. Typically, in Western Siberia, we have more than one producing reservoir penetrated by every well. It's very often we have several stacked reservoirs. So stimulation with multiple completion uh, would allow us to produce on the order of, say, 200 or 300 tons per day. Uh, the horizontal well uh, would also produce on the order of several hundred tons per day. I show also here two bars, the technical limit of the stimulated well with multiple completions and theoretical limit. Uh, we have not achieved that, but we have achieved this increase of production rate, this increase of efficiencies, and I will show the actual Average numbers for Sibneft is the company that I used to work for uh, only you know, half a year ago. So uh, this chart shows the production growth of Sibneft over three years from the about 43,000 tons per day to almost double, almost 90,000 tons per day. And half of the growth was coming from almost 100 horizontal well bores. Half of this growth of production was uh, coming from only about 100 horizontal wells. That At that point in time, we're representing only 2.4% of all of Sibneft's well stock. So that's the uh, significant improvement of efficiency and I also show the comparison of a, of a rate of a typical vertical well uh, with the horizontal well. A few years ago, most of the oil fields were developed using this pattern. It would be staggered line drive with the rows of injectors and typically three rows of producers between them. And this slide shows the actual development 
of the segment of Sugmutska oil field. Uh, at the very same field, we used a different technology. We did 3D seismic and built the reservoir models, and we drilled few horizontal wells, few horizontal producers. We also stimulated vertical wells where we did not have underlying water. So here we drilled a lot fewer wells. This segment is of the same size as the previous segment. It actually produces more oil than the previous segment. And here you can see that we drilled a lot fewer wells and spent a lot less capital. So that is how you know, Russian oil companies using the better technology can significantly reduce the capital requirements and $12 billion per year would be a reasonable number to maintain the production growth. Of course, the technology application and, uh, is extremely important. Technology application and uh, modern business practices are extremely important to achieve uh, those results. Uh, the, the concept of resource triangle is you know, well known and accepted in the literature, not only in petroleum engineering, but also in all of the natural resources, uh, geosciences. So the, the concept of resource triangle uh, is that there are few high quality resources and most of, of them, maybe all of them, have been found and developed already. But there is an abundance of lower quality resources and we need better technology and better prices to develop those resources. In petroleum engineering, the best measure or one of the best measures of this quality of resource is permeability. One might argue that it's actually mobility. So it's a, uh, viscosity is also important. Uh, in Western Siberia, we're dealing with, today we're dealing with the fields somewhere in this range from about 1 to 10 millidarcy. Most of the higher permeability reservoirs with thousands or hundred millidarcies have been developed and produced. So in this range of permeabilities from about 10 to 1 millidarcy, application of fracturing becomes extremely important. So uh, in, in Sibneft we employed uh, hydraulic fracturing technology and there were about 1,100 wells fractured in the so-called modern time after 1999. Uh, and the reason why I'm using this uh, year 1999 is after that we had the international service companies coming into Siberia and using the uh, modern technology. Uh, those wells contribute for about 37% of daily production. And the most important statistics is 83% of stimulated wells produced from less than 5 millidarcy reservoirs. And about 35% of those wells produced from less than 1 millidarcy reservoir. 10, 15 years ago, 5 millidarcy reservoir, oil reservoir, was not even considered commercial. So to, today we're working on those fields and uh, the recent experience shows that we can improve production and we can improve uh, recovery using uh, uh, fracturing and horizontal drilling. Typically, uh, we achieve about three to five fold productivity improvement uh, using hydraulic fracturing. This chart shows the percentage of daily production and average production rate that come from different types of completions. And uh, this is a recent chart that was done about you know, six months ago, and that is a snapshot of what was the average production rate for different kinds of completions. So typical vertical well was making about 100 barrels of oil per day, 
and about one third of production was coming from this typical vertical wells and those are legacy wells that have been drilled uh, during the uh, you know, Soviet time or before the application of modern technology. Fractured wells on the average make about twice as much as the a typical vertical well. Uh, horizontal side tracks uh, make even more and horizontal wells and horizontal wells with multiple fractures make about 10 to 20 times as much as a typical vertical well. So uh, that is more than an order of magnitude improvement in efficiencies. So we have actually achieved the numbers that Joe Mark was talking about when he you know, came to Russia with his experiences from all over the world. Uh, so th th this is very Im important for continued growth of Russian oil industry, application of modern technology and application of you know, good business practices. Uh, one more topic I wanted to talk about is the production activation index. The production activation index is an indicator of uh, a required investment to add one new barrel of oil in daily production in a given petroleum province. It's a very simple concept that gives an idea of what should be the equilibrium oil price or how much investment would be required to keep the uh, province active. For example, typical, and this estimate was done uh, you know, a few years ago, of course, with higher oil prices. That's one thing that I was not thinking about when I was putting together those estimates. With higher oil prices, uh, we see the significant increase in activity and the increase in production activation index. Uh, so the numbers that we will see here for production activation index, uh, they are representing about 2003-2004 period. Uh, th that's not the current state, but I also think that the current state is not characteristic. It's that uh, the current state you know, is caused by high oil prices and you know, strong demand for rigs, strong demand for services, and higher margins of the service companies and drilling companies. So typical West Texas well, say, you know, in 2002, would cost about half million dollars, but only produce about 50 uh, barrels per day. Uh, thus, the activation index would be equal to about 10,000 stock tank barrels per day. And this equation, it, it looks complicated, but in fact, it's very simple. It is the balance between the activation index, I sub P, and cash flow after tax, that's the share that the company retains uh, after it spends all the operational expenses and uh, pays taxes. The equilibrium oil price, it's P, and this term is the value of cumulative production generated by one barrel per day of production stream discounted by the time value of money and accounted for natural decline of the oil rate. So this, this whole term is really present value of future production of the production stream of one barrel of oil per day. So that's the equilibrium, the present value multiplied by cash flow after tax should be at least as large or more than activation index. In this case, the petroleum province becomes very active. Uh, this is the chart that 
originally was put together by uh, Professor Michael and Christine Economides, and I added several more data points uh, representing Russia. Uh, but this chart was originally made in 2002. So with the recent changes and recent increase in oil price and uh, growth of activities, uh, some numbers can change for production activation indices. On the x-axis, uh, we show production activation index in dollars per barrel of uh, barrel per day of production. On the y-axis, we show equilibrium oil price. And those lines represent different tax regimes, different cash flow after tax. Like, uh, for example, in Venezuela, the oil company would retain about 15% of the cash flow. The places like Western Siberia, uh, Russia, and Saudi Arabia would retain about 25% cash flow of the tax. And with the new changes in the uh, with the changes in tax uh, legislation in Russia, Eastern Siberia, new fields in Eastern Siberia, and the old fields, the depleted fields in mature areas, get some tax breaks that put their effective cash flow of the tax to about 40%. So but most countries, most producing basins would lie within this range from about 15 to about 40% cash flow of the tax. For the most basins, the production activation index is also in the range from about 1,000 to about, say, $11,000 per barrel per day of production. And from the equation on the previous page, you could see that the equilibrium oil price would have to be somewhere around 30 maybe to 40 dollars so what that tells it tells that with the current uh, tax regime in russia with the proposed changes and tax breaks for new provinces uh, russian oil industry would have to develop very actively but that also tells that current high oil prices are not sustainable and they will go down. And probably we should get to about 40, maybe $30 per barrel oil prices because that's how the math works. Uh, the, this slide shows the comparison between the activation indices in different areas. And when I was doing the lecture tour in different places, in, in Europe, in Azerbaijan, in Siberia, in the U.S., in uh, North Sea. I was checking what was their number for production activation index. And the, the lowest I have heard was the one in, in Azerbaijan, in Baku. That was slightly below $1,000 per barrel per day of production. They would spend about $20 million per well, but those wells would be making about you know, 30,000 barrels per day. So it was very, very you know, big wells offshore uh, in the Caspian. But most areas have the production activation index somewhere between one and say $11,000 per barrel per day of production. Also, I'm using a couple of slides from the Gazprom website to show what you know, gas industry in Russia looks like. Uh, the, the main company in, in the gas industry in Russia is Gazprom, which is a big producing company, and they also have transportation, a gas transportation system, gas storages, distribution. So it's a very large company with the market cap to today approximately of about $300 billion, maybe a little bit less. But if we look at the Gazprom reserves 
and that was even before Sibneft acquisition, they were over 100 billion barrels of oil equivalent. So today with uh, uh, Sibneft, it's probably about 115 billion barrels. So this is actually larger than six next largest competitors. This is a huge company. And uh, according to Gazprom internal forecast, the uh, gas production would stay you know, approximately at the current level or grow, grow slightly till the year 2020 and would be somewhere in the range between 550 a billion cubic meters per year to about 580, 590 billion cubic meters per year. So at the end of this presentation, I would like to reiterate those three important points that uh, I hope I was able to convince the audience uh, that those points are correct. So Russia is capable of increasing its oil production to about 12 million barrels of oil per day in the next seven to 10 years. And that will require approximately $12 billion per year in the oil field capex. And uh, Russian resource base is much larger than it's commonly believed, and it is at least 150 billion barrels of oil. Thank you. <laughs>